2016, we will celebrate our 100 years in the history. And that will be a big event um, coming in March 2016. I will also go to Munich um, in that period as well with some of the VIP guests. Um, there are a lot of things that we will do, um, not only to look back the last 100 years, but also to look into the next 100 years in the future as well. But that's the, um, there are a lot of things that we are planning um, right now for next year to celebrate the Centennial um, event. But as you see the, uh, the logo, um, the plane, and the motorcycle. Okay. So that indicates something, uh, what we developed in our uh, last many years. So basically, you see this um, propeller, mm -hmm. and yeah. which basically uh, we write the word when you on it, we have the, you see the logo, which is blue and white. So if you go to Munich, you see a lot of the souvenir <coughs> shops, you know, with the color blue and white. So that resembles the uh, color of the Bavarian state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we use the propeller because in the first, or in the early days, back in 1916, we launched the engine uh, for the plane. So we first produced the um, engine for the airplane as the first product from the company. And therefore, we used the popular um, logo. So it looks like the popular is now you know, turning on the sky, mm. blue and white. Mm. And that's where the logo came from since the 1916. And I know that a lot of you did the presentation on Germany and how the work ethic you know, for the Germans. So basically, this is one of the um, things that I would like to address. The German love challenges. They love to make new records. And that's why the test pilot, Frank you know, Diemer at the time, so took the plane, you know, which basically the engine uh, on the propeller was built by BMW, and fly to the top of the, um, well, not on the top, but on the, let's say, on the level where you normally fly the jet this, in this day without the oxygen. So basically he did that, you know, just to break a new record. You know, of course, he survived on the way down as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> in order to make this history life. So that's, you know, um, it is basically we tell this story because our people, our brand, our company, we are so fond of breaking new records. Mm. And that is set in our, in our culture. You know, to break new records and try to do better every time. Then, after the, um, the engine of the plane, then the next product that we have in our plan is the motorcycle, not the car yet. So we have this design of the two-wheeler called the R32 motorcycle. Um, unfortunately, I'm, we have only three guys in this room, so I will mm -hmm. say that anyone know how to ride a motorcycle? At all? You do? Wow, okay. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> In the old days, we have this engine uh, orientation we call the boxer engine. Basically, um, it's different than the normal engine that you have on, uh, on the motorcycle this day because the boxer engine will have the longitude um, cylinder. So it's just a little bit wider than normal because it has to take the air to cool down the, um, the engine. So it is a little bit wider than, than the normal one. But that's the uh, design of the engine we have those days until now today the um, new motorcycle on certain model we still have the boxer engine um, as well so it still resembles the, uh, the old tradition of the motorcycle making we have back then and then starting in 1928 we then start the first uh, car under the brand of BMW but at that time we bought the design from the British company it's called the Dixie yeah, so we didn't design the car at that time. So this type of car you will see anywhere, you know, in London and also in Germany as well. Then it comes to the period where we have the, the World War mm -hmm. um, around 1941. That's the period where the, um, the German um, have to basically concentrate on the ammunition and how to um, you know, fight the Country. So basically, BMW factory has been turned around. Instead of building motorcycle, instead of building car, we build mm -hmm. things for the, uh, the for the for the, for the for the battle. So that was the production back then, and this is only a few years after the whole plant was totally damaged by bomb. So basically, uh, the German lost the war uh, at the time and. Guess what? So instead of building anything related to the war, we will not allow 
Yeah, we're not allowed to build any motorcycle, we're not allowed to build any car, any engine, any plane whatsoever. We have to build on the top left, I'm um, sorry, on the bottom left, the utensil for the kitchen, mm. only to survive. And that really, um, if you look into this kind of, let's say, survival stages, you would not be surprised how the Germans are so tough, you know, in their culture, because they have been through so many um, stages, um, you know, from being the car from the motorcycle company and to build you know, such um, things during the, um, the war or after the war. I think that indicates how, how tough um, the German are and how you know, let's say flexible they can be. Yeah. Okay, but after that, slowly and gradually, um, back to the year 1955, BW are now coming you know, with their own design. And um, one of those um, successful models that we have, but some of you probably seen this car until this day, you know, in the museum or maybe even um, some of the places uh, in Bangkok. It's called the new Isetta, so it used the engine size of like the uh, motorcycle. But you can basically um, open the door from the front, so the steering wheel go out as well, and then the two adults go into the back. So that you can sit comfortably, um, two adults, and then we also have the BMW 600 and 700 to meet the customer demand in the post-war period. This is one of the, um, basically the, uh, the major milestone in the BMW history. We have Mr. Herbert Kwan, the gentleman on the, um, on, the, on the right. In that period, in 1959, this is the, um, the period where I would say BMW is about to uh, be taken over by Devil Chrysler. But in that meeting, in the um, <coughs> shareholder meeting, Mr. Herbert Juan then decided to buy the majority of the share and keep control of BMW without selling the company to Devil Chrysler. So we remain independent in that period. And until today, the Quan family, Q-U-A-N-D-T, Quan family, this is still the major shareholder of BMW until this day. Yeah, so they are considered the owner and the one who really keep the company alive um, and being independent from that period until now. Yeah. Then, the business is starting to take off really nicely. Um, from the year 1960, we have the uh, so-called BMW um, 16, um, five, uh, five, 1500 and then it comes to 1602 and then 2002. So this kind of the, um, the models are really successful for the um, BMW market. Fun to drive, very sporty. And then climbing, climbing to the year 1972. This is the building where when you go to Munich, you will see this building. Um, it looks like the cylinder of the engine. So it's called the four cylinder buildings and it's um, our head office. And the, um, uh, the building next to it is the museum where you're gonna go and visit inside uh, the museum as well. So this is the landmark of Munich, basically. And the way that they built this, um, this building is very um, innovative because instead of building from the first floor to the top floor, they put the core of the building in and then build from top to the bottom. So you lift the floor one by one from top down. And that's how they construct this building. So, and this is the office space inside the building, which if I go to the office um, this day, the space inside to look the same. Only the office equipment might be different. So instead of typewriter, you have the PC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's still the same. Uh, when you read this picture, I thought, wow, this is the same office that I have been to last year. It still looks the same. And amazing is that in each floor, it is so quiet. You, know, you wouldn't have a lot of people shouting. You know, and if you walk, I feel that I have to walk very lightly, yeah. <laughs> not to disturb them because it seems like um, they have they, they value their own space of working so much. Yeah, so and I got so many requests from the Thai authorities when they go to Munich and they say, "Wow, well, we want to visit your office in the full center. Can we do that?" I said, "Well, usually they take take office as a private space. So if you want to go for the tour, you go to the museum, but not in the office. Mm -hmm. So it is something that um, I have to explain to the Thai authority that well, sorry, but our office is not." Um, the area where I would take people around because imagine that they would be required and to take like 50 people, I think I get killed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then um, from 1972, then we also, um, as the Germans, are really um, passionate about the motorsport. So we also come up with the motorsport division in order to develop the racing car 
and to get our engineer um, to test the vehicle on the track and in order to bring the technology for the normal standard car as well. So Vindu Motorsport was um, invented at the time. And one of the turning points again, um, in the year 1994, Vindu bought the, um, a number of the British brands, so including Rover, Land Rover, MG, and Mini. So we bought these uh, four brands all together and then developed. Um, our product based on the existing technologies of this brand but only up until the year 2000 then we decided to keep only the mini brand the rest we sold to other um, investors so we sold Rover, we sold Land Rover, we sold MG and MG is now belong to the Chinese um, that you see now today only the mini that we keep under our umbrella so it then we have the three brands and this is the, um, uh, when I give my lecture, the differentiation of the brand that we see here, you have Rolls Royce on the very you know, pinnacle of the group. In the middle, you have BMW, and on the very um, bottom, but still very hip, is the Mini. So basically, BMW decide to do this branding strategy because they can differentiate the brand um, individually. So instead of making BMW for top to the bottom, they separate the brand. And that's, I think, how it made the brand so successful in its own. So each brand would have its own character, its own identity. I think it's, um, for the marketer, it's, uh, it's easier to identify each brand you know, separately. And then, of course, for each brand, we then have different um, body types um, for the vehicles. Like for BMW, you come from the small model to the bigger model, like the 1 series, the 2, 3, and the 4. So now, basically, you have um, everything from 1 to 7. Um, already covered in all the series. Um, I don't know if um, in the future there will be the 8 or the 9 series, it's not known yet. Yeah, but also in the SAV or the Sport Activity Vehicle, we also have the X model. So X stands for the um, all wheel drive, like X4, X1, X3. Um, and that is the another segment of BMW. Also, very really successful here in Thailand as well. And then of course the M, M which is stand for the motorsport. So if you ask what is BMW M, M is a sub brand within the umbrella of BMW, but it particularly develop more, um, the cars for um, for the you know those driving enthusiasts. So you have the, a very fine tuned engine. You have the um, the body which is lightweight, so making the car going quicker and faster. And then another sub brand that um, has been um, developed just recently is BMW i. I stand for the Born Electric, so it comes um, for the uh, electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid. I will go into detail later on in my presentation so that you can see a little bit more into the future, how we will live our life, how we drive our car 10 years from now, 15 years from now. I can tell you what kind of engine that you will be driving. It, it won't be the normal uh, fuel uh, combustion engine anymore. Yeah. And then of course the Mini which is very hip and um, smaller size, but then you also have the Mini Countryman, which is slightly bigger, uh, but still cater for the very individual um, group of people who want to be differentiated, want to be different um, from the rest. And then of course you have Rolls Royce, um, which is very um, unique um, group. I've been to the Rolls Royce plant in, in the UK once, and I must say that it is very amazing how they make these um, vehicles. Because if you go to the plant in, um, in Goodwood, in, uh, in the UK, you can talk to anyone in the production line. They will be so proud to present what they do. Mm -hmm. Some of them would do, uh, would do the rooftop of the, of the car. Some of them would do a special paint on the car. You can talk to them. All of them are the brand ambassador. They can tell you how long they have been with the company, how much they love what they do. Mm -hmm. And I was so amazed that, for example, in the roof line of the uh, Rolls Royce, you can have to uh, configuration, one is like the Galaxy from the European side, another one is Galaxy from the US side. So you have different configuration with the fiber optics. So when you look up, there's the ceiling, it's like looking at the sky with the star, but you have a different configuration. And then this, they told me that one of the millionaire, not millionaire, but billionaire from Mal Malaysia, told them that they want to have the sky, like looking from their um, palace in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> so they have that image on top of the roof, which they did it for that um, for that king in Malaysia. 
So it's very individualized um, uh, kind of uh, work that they do. Or take for example um, the special paint. Um, they can make the special paint that match the color of your wife's lipstick. Mm -hmm. Just bring it and they match it. <laughs> so don't be surprised why the car is very costly. <laughs> And then, of course, the um, Bingyu Motorrad. Um, this is back to the origin where Bingyu first um, have our um, product in our pipeline. So we have the uh, motorcycle in different segment. Very popular in Thailand, and I would say around the world or in Asia is the Enduro segment. Um, the R1200 years. So basically, this kind of bike can take you from Bangkok to China, from China to wherever. So it's go off-road, on-road, um, very durable. Um, we have touring, which is very popular for the police authority. So we have a number of the um, royal escort. We use the um, new motorcycle because of safety reason. We sell with, with the ABS system. Um, there are also roadster, there are sport bike, and the urban mobility like the scooter. Uh, so we differentiate by the type of the motorcycle uh, as well. So talking about sales and the volume success. So basically, this is the um, the three brands that uh, that we do our global um, sales, and this is um, how it looks like um, in the year 2014. Um, global um, sales last year was 1.8 million uh, for BMW, around 300,000 for Mini, and around 4,000 for for Rolls Royce. So, which is about 8% increase um, if you compare to the year before. So that has been um, you know quite impressive growing number from 1.2 to around 2.1 last year. Um, globally. What about Thailand? Thailand is not very bad. If we look um, back into the year 2009, we only saw about 2,700 uh, BMW vehicles. And last year we climbed up to, um, oh sorry, the number, okay. The number for the group is 8,386. BMW alone is 7,400, which is around 0.9% uh, 0 .9 decline because last year the market is not so stable due to the external um, factors, but Mini was uh, able to increase by about 51% and Mini motorcycle is about 75% increase. This year, motorcycle increased by 140%, so the big bike market is very hot now today. And one of the things that I can proudly address about our plant here in Rayong, we have our Mini group manufacturing plant um, located at the Amata City uh, Industrial Estate. Basically, we produce um, BMW, Mini, and Mini motorcycle. And this is the only plant in the world that produces all three brands all three. from the three sides. So there's no other plant within the, um, you know, we have 14, uh, 14 countries, we have 30 um, plants, but this is the only plant where we produce all three brands you know, in the same location. And if you ask the many director at the plants, you know, how can we do that? How can we have so many brands under the same um, roof? And they say because the Thai skill are really, you know, really unique, they can be adjustable. You, know, you can make the mini, they can make the Thai, um, sorry, the, the BMW, or they can make the motorcycle. So I think it has to do with the human skills, you know, but that is so flexible, you know, and we are able to handle so many diverse kind of uh, body variants within the plant production. So that display the total of 17, yeah? From the conceptual idea, to produce all three mm -hmm. to SOP startup production. It was a time thing. Oh, very really difficult because um, normally when you refer to BMW, there's the model code, yeah. like the three series. Um, the current three series we call the F30. Yeah. yeah. So in the past it was like the E46. And these are the model code come from E46, E47, E48. So from the conceptual model, they put the level of the model code develop it and then present it to the board. If it doesn't get approved, it gets thrown away. Yeah. So you go from E46 maybe to E49 instead of E47 and E48 yeah. because it gets thrown away. So from the conceptual, it is hard to say because sometimes you have different, yeah, different um, kind of uh, approval that you get. Um, once you are approved, then you go to the production. Yeah, but of course, in terms of the, um, the uh, the exact time frame of the model development 
to the protection to the launch to the market, you have to also monitor the competitor as well. Uh, what are they going to be launching next year? So what about us? Shall we do it before? Shall we do it after? So there are strategy behind. So the time frame is um, quite uh, difficult to say. Mm -hmm. how, 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 how long will it be? So these are all the models that we um, we do with our local assembly here in Thailand. So we have the 3 series, 5 series, 7 series, the 3 series, Sedan and GT, the 1 series, X1, X3, X5, Mini Countryman, and up to 8 models of the motorcycle these days. Which basically we also export the motorcycle to China as well. Okay, so now talking about the future of the automotive. One philosophy of BW is sustainability. So whatever we do in our product, we talk about sustainability, making sure that we don't uh, consume more fuel. We try to reduce the fuel consumption. We try to minimize the emission. And um, that has been the uh, philosophy for our um, product design and the way that we do with the business today. I want to show you this, uh, this graph where we call the iconic change. Because um, if you look back into the history, doesn't matter how much um, you can try to develop the sailing boat, it gets superseded by the, you know, by the, by the steamboat. And if you look back into the camera in the old days where you have the product stream and then the normal um, analog um, camera, it doesn't matter how much you can do you know, to develop this kind of camera, it gets replaced by the digital camera. And I think very soon you get replaced by the mobile phone, which will then be you know, having the quality exactly or even better than the digital uh, camera. We can't change that, and that's the iconic change. Yeah. So, what about the mobility of the future? You know, if this day we're driving on the normal car with the fuel uh, con um, combustion engine, it will be replaced by the electric vehicles. So it doesn't matter how much you can develop your combustion engine, it will get uh, replaced anyway. We can't change that. And this is basically the, um, the frame of the CO2 regulation in the European, China, and USA. So every country is trying their best to reduce the, the, uh, the amount of the CO2 or the amount of emission. And therefore, electric vehicle is the solution where we can reduce the use of fuel. And this is the, basically the graph that I always show to the media when they ask, well, in how many years do we get the number of the electric vehicle on the road? So this is the forecast of the um, on the bottom part is the combustion engine, which is the the regular engine that you are running this day. Mm -hmm. So it will be still be selling. You know, now we are about you know, 2015. So 2020, of course, you still selling this vehicle. But then after that, it gets reduced, replaced by hybrid, trucking hybrid, and the battery vehicle. So it takes some time, but these are the vehicle that will grow gradually from 2020 onwards. That's how we look at the future. And this is the research that, uh, um, that they have done um, to ask, well, how much, what kind of mileage that we do our mm -hmm. daily driving. Mm -hmm. So basically, you can see that the daily um, driving average in Germany is about 30 kilometers per day, not more. In UK, about 48. In China, about 49. So we don't do more than 100 kilometers driving per day in general. Yeah? And that's why they have this uh, charge in order to develop the electric vehicle. So what about the battery vehicle? Mm -hmm. If you charge for one time, how much would you be able to drive in a day and you know, still within the normal daily driving average? And this is the um, 40 years that we have done our research and development on the electric vehicle. So it has taken time since the 1972 up until 2013, then we developed the first product we call the BU i3, yeah, which is the purely electric vehicle. Why do we have to do that? Yeah, um, there are so many the factors that um, force us to um, develop these technologies. Whether it comes from the environment, from the urbanization, because by 2000, 2030, you know, over 60 of the world population will be living in the cities. So we have to be thinking carefully how you can reduce emission within the city. There are politics and regulation. You know, the, in the EU, EU zone, the um, CO2 regulation is getting very strict. Economy as well, in terms of culture and customer expectation. They also want to have a better um, atmosphere driving you know, with the new technologies. So there are the uh, research lists you know, when they come to the electric vehicle. So what would be the checklist? What do people want? 
in the electric vehicle. So of course, they want to have a driving pleasure. They want to have the emotional appeal. They have to look sexy. They have to look cool. Mm. Yeah. So these are still the um, things that we put together in our checklist to develop the electric vehicle. And then we have the development concept of the i3. The next one is the i8. And then the talking about the new material, which is the recycled material as well. And then the new architecture for building the vehicles. I go into detail. So this is how the i3 looks like. Um, we launched, not launched, but we introduced the i3 to the market earlier this year at the Bangkok Motor Show. Um, it gained a lot of interest, but of course in Thailand, the price of vehicles is still very high. And people this day, you saw the graph. So from now until 2020, still, you know, electric vehicle doesn't sell much. People still have a lot of questions. You know, if I buy this car, how much can I drive? Mm -hmm. If my battery dies, where can I charge? So mm -hmm. there's still a lot of questions. But to let you know that uh, we also talk to PDT as well, and they are also putting a lot of the pilot station. So the future is coming. They are planning as well. There are a lot. Um, there are a number of the charging station that PDT already put up. Even though they have not opened that to the public yet, but they are testing electric vehicle in those routes. So I think sooner in the future you will be driving one of them. And this is designed inside the i3. So even though the sky is small, but we designed the door where it's wide open so you can fit in four doubts um, in the car. I look in the rear. This is inside the vehicle, so it's kind of floating concept. So a lot of space where you can sit comfortably. And this is the space behind, fold down the seat and you can take a lot of cardboard space um, as well. And this is basically the architecture where we um, it looks totally different than the normal cars that we have these days. On top, you have the passenger cell, which is made of carbon fiber. So basically, this material is 50% lighter than steel. So, and on the bottom, you have the battery cell down below in order to put the center of gravity to the bottom. And why do we have to come up with the carbon fiber? Because basically, the battery is very heavy. So how to compensate? You have to develop new material that's lighter than normal so that the car can go further. How it looks like with the light module put on top, and then you have the car with the battery, and that's how the um, carbon fiber looks like when you close it up. And that's how the um, the architecture of the new i3 looks like. So it has 170 horsepower. I have driven the car um, already. It's so hard to drive, and the way that you drive the car is <clears throat> it's not the same as normal car because. If you drive normal car, right, you go to the red light, then you put your, your, your foot on the brake, and then the car stops. For the electric vehicle, you don't have to, because the car has the, um, what do you call, the uh, resistance. So basically, if you um, know how to uh, clear your right foot, so basically you step on the uh, accelerator, and then if you take it off, the car slows down. So you don't have to brake, it will go to stop at the red light, so sometimes you don't use the brake pedal at all. But when you put your foot on the accelerator, go like jet engine so fast. That's how electric cars works. Yeah. And um, just to compare the specification of the i3 with the Mini Cooper S, because basically the Mini is well known for its go-kart <laughs> driving feeling. So 170 for the i3, 184 for the uh, Cooper S. But you can see a difference. Acceleration, i3 is 0 to 100 in 7.9 seconds. Mini can do it in 7.2, but talking about the electric range in the real world, so basically 130 to 160 kilometers without using the fuel, so only the battery. And this is how the car will, uh, will be charged. Mm. We also put up this um, charging station just two weeks ago at the Central World, mm. so that um, mm. our customer who bought i8 can then go there and park the car and then charge it. Mm. To the car without charge. Yeah. And this is the um, the project we had last year. Um, we launched the um, i3 and i8 together with our board member, Dr. Draker. So in this picture, um, what we did, we announced our R&D collaboration with Chulalongkorn University. So what we are doing with the, um, the Department of Engineering in Chulalongkorn is to develop the quick charger. You saw in this chart that the quick charger. It's about this size, right? And this is what you see now today. What we're trying to develop with Chulalongkorn um, students is to reduce the size of the charger to the 
to the size that you can put in the car. That's the way that we want to develop. And it is interesting because we are doing this in Thailand. So I hope that uh, we have the R&D um, successful with the outcome. And hopefully that we can do marketing on this uh, quick charger in the future as well. Yeah. Okay, and since you are going to Munich, there are also the, um, some topic about the uh, ethic um, that I want to throw in as well. So I just want to put our basic principle in the chart before I end my uh, presentation today. In Bin Group Thailand, we have um, for every new employee, you know, um, we would have the induction program, and then we will um, we will uh, get them to understand the basic principle. What is the um, culture from the view and how do they work within this our culture? So we have the let's say the video quality um, that we work around. So we believe in the customer orientation. So our customer um, is determined our success. And that's why we have to pay um, attention to our customer. And what we do in our organization, we have the customer satisfaction index. So basically, whenever our customer buy a car, whenever they bring the car for service, we have to measure their satisfaction level. So, and then our dealer will get incentivized um, based on the um, ranking of the customer satisfaction index as well. So this is what we do to measure um, our business. We believe in the peak performance, um, doing our best. We believe in responsibility and the effectiveness um, in the way that we do our work. Adaptability as well. This is uh, to ensure our long-term success. We have to be, um, must be able to adapt to new challenges. This is what we believe in our value. We have to be friendless uh, or distant in our, um, you know, in to, uh, to derive the solution for the best. Respect, trust, and fairness. You know, we treat each other with fairness in our um, everyday business not only within our organization, but also with our supplier, with our dealer, with our business partner as well. And for our associate, we, um, you know, we are you know, what we make the company. So we are the strongest factor of success. So we believe in the value of the human being. Leading by example, so every manager, we have to lead by example. This is uh, what we try to press to our um, uh, colleagues as well. And like I say in the beginning, sustainability will always be our philosophy to develop our product and the way that we work around it. To society, we have to be responsible for the society as well, like the emission that we try to reduce. And independent, we remain as the corporate independent, so BW Group is not um, overtaken by any other brands. So, that's basically my presentation today. So I probably have about 15 minutes for any Q&A, any open discussion, any question you might have in mind, so please feel free. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, practice your open train <laughs> direct Direct <laughs> question. Uh, Please. Competition is asking. <laughs> competition is asking. No. Toyota is asking. No, not competition. We are in different segments, so we can be friends. <laughs> <laughs> not not going to buy all cars, by the way. Competition. I want to know what BMW stands for. Okay. Is the um, German? Is, um, Correct me if I, my pronunciation is not correct. It's a uh, Bajorish motor and work. So the motor work from Bayern. Yes. Yeah. So the, uh, Bajorish. 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 Bajor